Mr. President, President in Office of the Council, Honourable Members, Ladies and Gentlemen. In eight months' time, voters across Europe will judge what we have achieved together in the last five years. In these five years, Europe has been more present in the lives of citizens than ever before. Europe has been discussed in the coffee houses and popular talk shows all over our continent. Today, I want to look at what we have done together, at what we have yet to do, and I want to present what I believe are the main ideas for a truly European political debate ahead of next year's elections. Honorable members, as we speak exactly five years ago, the United States government took over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, bailed out AIG, and Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy protection. These events triggered the global financial crisis. It evolved into an unprecedented economic crisis, and it became a social crisis with dramatic consequences for many of our citizens. These events have aggravated the debt problem that still distresses our governments. They have led to an alarming increase in employment, especially amongst young people, and they are still holding back our households and our companies. But Europe has fought back. In those five years, we have given a determined response. We suffered the crisis together, we realized we had to fight it together, and we did, and we are doing it. If we look back and think about what we have done together throughout the crisis, I think it's fair to say that we would never have thought all of this possible five years ago. We are fundamentally reforming the financial sector so that people's savings are safe. We have improved the way governments work together, how they return to sound public finances and modernize their economies. We have mobilized over 700 billion euro to pull crisis-struck countries back from the brink, the biggest effort ever in stabilization between countries. I still vividly remember my meeting last year with chief economists of many of our leading banks. Most of them were expecting Greece to leave the euro. All of them feared the disintegration of the euro area. Now, we can give a clear reply to those fears. No one has left or has been forced to leave the euro. This year, the European Union enlarged from 27 to 28 member states, and next year, the euro area will grow from 17 to 18 member states. What matters now is what we make of this progress. Do we talk it up or talk it down? Do we draw confidence from it to pursue what we have started, or do we belittle the results of our efforts? Honorable members, I just came back from the G20 in St. Petersburg. I can tell you, this year, contrary to recent years, we Europeans did not receive any lessons from other parts of the world on how to address the crisis. We received appreciation and encouragement. Not because the crisis is over, because it is not over. But the resilience of our union has been tested and will continue to be tested. But what we are doing creates the confidence that we are overcoming the crisis, provided we are not complacent. We are tackling our challenges together and we have to tackle them together. Because in our world of geoeconomic and geopolitical tectonic changes, I believe that only together, as the European Union, we can give our citizens what they aspire, that our values, our interests, our prosperity are protected and promoted in the age of globalization. So now is the time to rise above purely national issues and parochial interests, and to have real progress for Europe, to bring a truly European perspective to debate with national constituencies. Now is the time for all those who care about Europe, whatever their political or ideological position, wherever they come from, to speak up for Europe. If we ourselves don't do it, we cannot expect others to do it either. Honorable members, we have come a long way since the start of the crisis. In last year's State of the Union speech, I stated that despite all our efforts, our responses have not yet convinced citizens markets, or our international partners. One year on, 
the facts tell us that our efforts have started to convince. Overall spreads are coming down. The most vulnerable countries are paying less to borrow. Industrial output is increasing. Market trust is returning. Stock markets are performing well. The business outlook is steadily improving. Consumer confidence is sharply rising. We see that the countries who are most vulnerable to the crisis and are now doing most to reform their economies are starting to note positive results. In Spain, as a signal of the very important reforms and increased competitiveness, exports of goods and services now make up 33% of GDP, more than ever since the introduction of the euro. Ireland has been able to draw money from capital markets since the summer of 2012. The economy is expected to grow for a third consecutive year in 2013, and Irish manufacturing companies are rehiring staff. In Portugal, the external current account, which was structurally negative, is now expected to be broadly balanced, and growth is picking up after many quarters in the red. Greece has completed, just in three years, a truly remarkable fiscal adjustment, is regaining competitiveness, and is nearing, for the first time in decades, a primary surplus. And Cyprus, that started the program later, is also implementing that program as scheduled, which is a precondition for return to growth. So my point is this. For Europe, recovery is within sight. Let's be realistic in analysis. Let's not overestimate the positive results, but let's not also underestimate what has been done. Of course, we need to be vigilant. One swallow does not make a summer, nor one fine day. Even one fine quarter does not mean we are out of the economic heavy weather. But it does prove we are on the right track. On the basis of the figures and evolutions as we now see them, we have good reason to be confident. This should push us to keep up our efforts. We owe it to those for whom the recovery is not yet within reach, to those who do not yet profit from positive development. We owe it to our 26 million unemployed, especially to the young people unemployed that are looking to us and they want to have reasons to feel hope about Europe and about their own countries. So hope and confidence is also part of the economic equation. Honourable members, if we are where we are today, it is because we have shown the resolve to adapt both our politics and our policies to the lessons drawn from the crisis. And when I say we, I really mean we. It has really been a joint effort. At each and every step, you, the European Parliament, you have played a decisive role through one of the most impressive records of legislative work ever. I personally believe this is not sufficiently known by the citizens of Europe, and you deserve more credit and recognition for this. So let us continue to work together to reform our economies for growth and jobs, and to adapt our institutional architecture. Only if we do so, we'll leave this phase of the crisis behind us as well. There is a lot we can still deliver together in this Parliament's and this Commission's mandate. What we can and must do, first and foremost, let's be concrete, is delivering the banking union. It is the first and most urgent phase on the way to deepen our economic and monetary union as mapped out in the Commission's blueprint presented last autumn. The legislative process on the single supervisory mechanism is almost completed. The next step is the ECB's independent valuation of bank assets before it takes up its supervisory role. Our attention now must urgently turn to the single resolution mechanism. The Commission's proposal is on the table since July, and together we must do the necessary to have it adopted still during this term. In, it is the way to ensure that taxpayers are no longer the ones in the front line for paying the price of bank failure. It is the way to make progress in decoupling bank from sovereign risk. It is the way to remedy one of the most alarming and unacceptable results of the crisis, increased fragmentation of Europe's financial sector and credit markets, even an implicit renationalization. And it is also the way 
to help restoring normal lending to the economy, notably to SMEs. Because in spite of the accommodating monetary policy, credit is not yet sufficiently flowing to the economy across the euro area. This needs to be addressed resolutely. Ultimately, this is about one thing, growth, which is necessary to remedy today's most pressing problem, unemployment. The current level of unemployment is economically unsustainable, politically untenable, socially unacceptable. So all of us here in the Commission, and I'm happy to have all my colleagues of the Commission today with me, all of us, not only one or two commissioners, but this is a collective effort, all of us want to work with you intensively to deliver as much of our growth agenda, our sustainable growth agenda, as we possibly can. We are mobilizing all the instruments we have at European level. But of course, we have to be honest, not all instruments are at European level. Some of them are at national level. And I want to focus on the implementation of the decisions that are most crucial now. Youth employment and financing the real economy for SMEs. We need also to avoid a jobless recovery. Europe, therefore, must speed up the pace of structural reforms. Our country-specific recommendations set out what the member states must do in this respect. And at European level, because there is what can be done at national and what can be done at European level, the focus should be also on what matters most for the real economy, exploiting the full potential of the single market comes first. We have a well-functioning single market for goods, and we see the economic benefits of that. We need to extend the same formula to other areas, mobility, communications, energy, finance, and e-commerce, to name but a few. We have to remove the obstacles that hold back dynamic companies and people. We have to complete connecting Europe. I'd like to announce that today we will formally adopt a proposal that gives a push towards a single market for telecoms. Citizens know that Europe has dramatically brought down their costs for roaming. Our proposal will strengthen guarantees and lower prices for consumers and present new opportunities for companies. We know that in the future, trade will be more and more digital. Isn't it a paradox that we have an internal market for goods, but when it comes to digital market, we have 28 national markets? How can we? grab all the opportunities of the future that are opened by the digital economy if we don't conclude this internal market. <laughs> the same logic applies to the digital, the broader digital agenda. It solves real problems and improves daily life for citizens. The strength of Europe's future industrial base depends on how well people and business are interconnected. And by properly combining the digital agenda with data protection and defense of privacy, our European model strengthens the trust of the citizens, both with respect to internal and external developments. Adopting the proposal legislation on data protection is of utmost importance to the European Commission. The single market is a key lever for competitiveness and employment. Adopting all remaining proposals under the Single Market Act 1 and 2 and implementing the Connecting Europe facility in the next few months, we lay the foundations for prosperity in the years to come. We are also adapting to a dynamic transformation on a global scale. So we must encourage this innovative dynamism at a European scale. That is why we must also invest more in innovation, in technology, and the role of science. I have a great space in science, in the capacity of the human mind and capacity of a creative society to solve its problems. The world is changing dramatically, and I believe many of the solutions are going to come in Europe and outside Europe from new science discoveries, from new technologies, and I would like Europe to be leading that effort globally. This is why we, Parliament and Commission, we have made such a priority of Horizon 2020 in the discussions on the European Union budget. That is why we use the European Union budget to invest in skills, education, and vocational training, dynamizing and supporting talent. That is why we have pushed for Erasmus+. And that is why 
later this autumn, we will make further proposals for an industrial policy fit for the 21st century, while we mobilize support for SMEs, because we believe a strong, dynamic industrial base is indispensable for a strong European economy. And uh, whilst fighting climate change, our 2020-20 goals have set our economy on the path to green growth and resource efficiency, reducing costs and creating jobs. By the end of this year, we'll come up with concrete proposals for our energy and climate framework up to 2030. And we'll continue to shape the international agenda by fleshing out a comprehensive, legally binding global climate agreement by 2015 with our partners. Frankly, we need the others also on board. Europe alone cannot do all the fight against climate change. We need a level playing field globally and we should lead that effort. At the same time, we will pursue our work on the impact of energy prices on competitiveness and also on social cohesion. All these drivers for growth are part of our Europe 2020 agenda and fully and swiftly implementing it is more urgent than ever. In some cases, we have even to go beyond the Europe 2020 agenda. This means we must also pursue our active and assertive trade agenda. It is about linking us closer to growing third markets and guaranteeing our place in the global supply chain. Contrary to perception, when most of our citizens think that we are losing in global trade, in fact, we have been increasing our surplus uh, to the rest of the world. We have a significant and increased trade surplus of more than 300 billion euro a year in goods, in service and agriculture. We need to build on that. This too will demand our full attention in the months to come, notably with the transatlantic trade and investment partnership with the US and the negotiations with Canada and Japan. And last but not least, we need to step up our game in implementing the multi-annual financial framework, the European budget. The EU budget is the most concrete lever we have at hand to boost investment in some of our regions. The European investment is the only way they have to get some public investment because they cannot now have the resource, uh, have resources at national level. Both the European Parliament and the Commission wanted more resources. We have been in that fight together. But even so, let's be honest, one single year's EU budget represents more money at today's prices than the old Marshall Plan in its time. Let us now make sure that the programs can start on the 1st of January 2014, that the results are being felt on the ground in our regions across Europe, and that we use the possibilities of innovative financing from instruments that have already started to European investment bank money to project bonds. We have to make good on the commitment we have made in July. From the Commission side, we will deliver. We will, for example, present the second amending budget for 2014, still this month. There is no time to waste. So I warn against holding it up. In particular, I urge member states not to delay. I cannot emphasize this enough. Citizens will not be convinced with rhetoric and promises only, but with a concrete set of common achievements. We have to show the many areas where Europe has solved problems for citizens, Europe is not the cause of problems. Europe is part of the solution. I address what we have to do still more extensively in today's letter to the President of the European Parliament, which you will also receive, so I will not go now in detail regarding our program for next year. But my point today is clear. Together, there is still a lot to achieve before the election. It's not the time to throw down the towel. It's the, the time to uh, put our sleeves up and work a lot. Honorable members, of course, none of this is easy. I think that everybody recognizes that we have been living extremely challenging times, a real stress test to the European Union. We know also that the path of permanent and profound reform is as demanding as it is unavoidable. Let's make no mistake. There is no way back to business as usual. Some people believe that after this, everything will come back as it was before. They are wrong. This crisis is different. 
This is not a cyclical crisis, but a structural crisis. We will not come back to the old normal. We have to shape a new normal. We are in a transforming period of history. And we have to understand that. And not just say it, but to draw all the consequences for this, including in our state of mind and how we react to the problems. We see from the first results that it is possible to win that battle. And we all know that it's not only possible, that it is necessary. At this point in time, with a fragile recovery, the biggest downside risk I see is, you know what, is political. This is the biggest downside risk we have. Lack of stability or lack of determination and perseverance. Over the last years, we have seen that anything that casts doubt on government's commitment to reform is instantly punished. On the positive side, strong and convincing decisions have an important and immediate impact. In this phase of the crisis, government's job is to provide the certainty and predictability that markets still lack. I'm sure you all know Justus Lipsius. Justus Lipsius is the name of the council building in Brussels. Justus Lipsius was a very influential 16th century humanist scholar that wrote a very important book called De Constantia. He wrote, constancy is a right and immovable strength of the mind, neither lift up nor press down with external or casual accidents. Only a strength of the mind, he argued, based on judgment and sound reason can help you through confusing and alarming times. I hope that in these times, uh, difficult times, all of us, including the government representatives that meet at the Justus Lipsius building, show that determination, that perseverance, and it speak, uh, when it comes to the implementation of the decisions taken. Because one of the issues that we have is to be coherent, not just take decisions, but afterwards be able to implement them on the ground. <laughs> Honorable members, it is only natural that over the last few years, our efforts to overcome the economic crisis have overshadowed everything else. But our idea of Europe needs to go far beyond econo economy. We are much more than a market. The European ideal touches the very foundations of European society. It is about values. And I underline this word, values. It is based on a firm belief in political, social, and economic standards grounded in our social market economy. In today's world, the European Union level is indispensable to protect these values and standards and promote citizens' rights, from consumer protection to labor rights, from women's rights to respect for minorities, from environmental standards to data protection and privacy. Whether defending our interests in the international trade securing our energy provision, or restoring people's sense of fairness by fighting tax fraud and tax evasion, only by acting as a union do we pull our weight at the world stage. Whether seeking impact for the development and humanitarian aid we give to developing countries, managing our common external borders, or promoting Europe, in Europe a strong, security and defense policy, only by integrating more can we really reach our objectives. There is no doubt about it. Our internal coherence and international relevance are inextricably linked. Our economic attraction and political traction are fundamentally entwined. Does anyone seriously believe that if the euro had collapsed, we or our member states would still have any credibility left internationally? Does everyone still realize how enlargement has been a success in terms of healing history's deep scars in establishing democracies where some years ago no one had thought it possible? How neighborhood policy was and still is the best way to provide security and prosperity in regions of vital importance for Europe? Where would we be all in all, without all of this? Today, countries like Ukraine are more than ever seeking closer ties to the European Union, attracted by our economic and social model. We cannot turn our back on them. 
we cannot accept any attempt to limit this country's own sovereign choices. Free will and free consent need to be respected. These are also the principles that lie at the basis of our Eastern partnership, which we want to take forward at our summit in Vilnius. <clears throat> and does everyone still remember just how much Europe has suffered from its war during the last century and how European integration was the valid answer? Next year, it will be one century after the start of First World War, a war that tore Europe apart from Sarajevo to the Somme. We must never take peace for granted. We need to recall that it is because of Europe that former enemies now sit around the same table and work together. It is only because they were offered a European perspective that now even Serbia and Kosovo came to an agreement under the mediation of the European Union. Last year's Nobel Peace Prize reminded us of that historic achievement, that Europe is a project of peace. We should be more aware of it ourselves. Sometimes I think we should not be ashamed to be proud. One thing is arrogance. We don't want to be arrogant. But we should be proud of Europe, what we have achieved. We should look towards the future, but with the wisdom we gained from the past. Let me say this to all those who rejoice in Europe's difficulties and who want to roll back our integration and go back to isolation. The pre-integrated Europe of the divisions, the war, the trenches, is not what people desire and deserve. The European continent has never in its history known such a long period of peace as since the creation of the European community. It is our duty to preserve it and to deepen it. Honorable members, it is precisely with these values that we address the unbearable situation in Syria, which has tested over the last months the world's conscience so severely. The European Union has led the international aid response by mobilizing close to 1.5 billion euros, of which 850 million euros comes directly from the European Union budget. The Commission will do its utmost to help the Syrian people and refugees in neighboring countries. We have recently witnessed events we thought had long been eradicated. The use of chemical weapons is a horrendous act that deserves a clear condemnation and a strong answer. The international community, with the United Nations at its center, carries a collective responsibility to sanction these acts and to put an end to this conflict. The proposal to put serious chemical weapons beyond use is potentially a positive development. The Syrian regime must now demonstrate that it will implement this without any delay. In Europe, we believe that ultimately, only a political solution stands a chance of delivering the lasting peace that the Syrian people deserve. Honorable members, there are those who claim that a weaker Europe would make their country stronger, that Europe is a burden, they would be better off without it. My reply is clear. We all need a Europe that is united, strong, and open. In the debate that is ongoing all across Europe, the bottom line question is, do you want to improve Europe or give it up? My answer is clear. Let's engage. If you don't like Europe as it is, improve it. Find ways to make it stronger, internally and internationally, and you will have in me the firmest of supporters. Find ways that allow for diversity without creating discrimination, and I will be with you all the way. But don't turn away from it. I recognize, as any human endeavor, the European Union is not perfect. For example, controversies about division of labor between the national and European levels will never be conclusively ended. I value subsidiarity highly. For me, subsidiarity is not a technical concept. It's a fundamental democratic principle. A never closer union among the citizens of Europe demands that decisions are taken as open and transparently as possible, and as closely to the people as possible. Not everything needs a solution at European level. Europe must focus on where it can add most value. Where this is not the case, it should not meddle. The European Union needs to be big on big things and smaller on smaller things.
something we may occasionally have neglected in the past. The European Union needs to show it has the capacity to set both positive and negative priorities. As all governments, we need to take extra care of the quality and quantity of our regulation, knowing that, as Montesquieu said, les lois inutiles affaiblissent les lois nécessaires. Useless laws weaken the necessary ones. But there are, honorable members, areas of major importance where Europe must have more integration, more unity, where only a strong Europe can deliver results. I believe a political union needs to be our political horizon, as I stressed in last year's State of the Union. This is not just demand of a passionate European. This is an indispensable way forward to consolidate our progress and ensure the future. Ultimately, the solidity of our policies, namely of the Economic and Monetary Union, depend on the credibility of the political and institutional construct that supports it. So we have mapped out in the Commission blueprint for a deep and genuine economic and monetary union, not only the economic and monetary features, but also the necessities, possibilities, and limits of deepening our institutional setup in the medium and long term. The Commission will continue to work for the implementation of its blueprint, step by step, one phase after the other. And I confirm, as announced last year, the intention to present before the European elections further ideas on the future of our Union and how best to consolidate and deepen the community method and the community approach in the longer term. That way, these ideas can be subject to a real European debate. They will set out the principles and orientations that are necessary for a true political union. Honourable members, we can only meet the challenge of our time if we strengthen the consensus on fundamental objectives. Politically, we must not be divided by difference between the euro area and those outside it, between the centre and periphery, between north and south, between east and west. The European Union must remain a project for all members, a community of equals. Economically, Europe has always been a way to close gaps between countries, regions and people, and that must remain so. We cannot do member states work for them. The responsibility remains theirs, but we can and must complement it with European responsibility and European solidarity. For that reason, strengthening the social dimension is a priority for the months to come, together with our social partners. The Commission will come with its communication on the social dimension of the Economic and Monetary Union on the 2nd of October. Solidarity is a key element of what being part of Europe is all about and something to take pride on. Safeguarding its values, such as the rule of law, is what the European Union was made to do from its inception to the latest chapters in enlargement. In last year's State of the Union speech, at the moment of challenges to the rule of law in our own member state, I addressed the need to make a bridge between political persuasion and targeted infringement procedures on one hand and the, what I call nuclear option of Article 7 of the treaty, namely suspension of a member state's rights. Experience has confirmed the usefulness of the Commission role as an independent and objective referee. We should consolidate this experience through a more general framework. It should be based on the principle of equality between member states activated only in situations where there is a serious systemic risk to the rule of law and triggered by predefined benchmarks. The Commission will come forward with a communication on this. I believe it is a debate key to our idea of Europe. This does not mean that national sovereignty or democracy are constrained, but we do need a robust European mechanism to influence the equation when basic common principles are at stake. There are certain non-negotiable values that the European Union and its member states must and shall always defend. <clears throat> Honourable members, the polarisation that resulted from the crisis poses a risk to us all, to the project, to the European project. We, legitimate representatives of the European Union, can turn the tide. You, direct democratic representatives of Europe, directly elected, you will be at the forefront of the political debate. The question I want to pose to you is the following. 
which picture of Europe will voters be presented with? The candid version or the cartoon version? The myths or the facts? The honest, reasonable version or the extremist, populist version? It's an important choice to make. I know some people out there will say Europe is to blame for the crisis and the hardship. But we can remind people that the European Union was not at the origin of the crisis. It resulted from mismanagement of public finances from the national governments and irresponsible behavior in the financial market. We can explain how Europe has worked to fix the crisis, what we would have lost if we had not succeeded in upholding the single market, because the single market was under threat, and upholding the common currency, because some time ago some people were predicting the end of the common currency. If we had not coordinated recovery efforts and employment initiatives, how would we be now? Some people will say that it is Europe that is forcing governments to cut spending. But we can remind voters that government debt got way out of hand even before the crisis. Not because, but despite Europe. We can add that the most vulnerable in our society and our children will end up paying the price if we don't persevere now. And the truth is that countries inside the euro or outside the euro, in Europe or outside Europe, they are making efforts to curb their very burdened public finances. Some will campaign saying that we have given too much money to vulnerable countries. Others will say that we have given too little money to the most vulnerable countries. But every one of us can explain what we did and why. There is a direct link between one country's loans and another country's banks, between one country's investments and another country's business, between one country's workers and another country's companies. This kind of interdependence means only European solutions can work. And what I tell people is, when you are in the same boat, one cannot say your end of the boat is sinking. We were in the same boat when things went well, and we are in it together when things are difficult. Some people might campaign saying, Europe has grabbed too much power. Others will claim Europe always does too little, too late. The interesting, the interesting thing is that sometimes we have the same, saying that Europe is not doing enough, and at the same time not, not giving more instruments for Europe to do what Europe has to do. But we can explain that member states have entrusted Europe with tasks and competences. The European Union is not a foreign power. The European Union is the result of democratic decisions of the institutions and the member states. At the same time, we must acknowledge that in some areas, Europe still lacks the power to do what is asked of it, a fact that is all too easily forgotten by those, and we know there are many out there, that are always ready to nationalize success and to Europeanize failure. Ultimately, what we have and what we don't have is the result of democratic decision-making, and I think we should remind people of that. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, honorable members, I hope the European Parliament will take up this challenge with the old idealism it holds, with as much realism and determination as the times demand of us. The arguments are there. The facts are there. The agenda has been set out. In eight months' time, voters will decide. Now it's up to us to make the case for Europe. We can do so by using the next eight months to conclude as much as we can. We have a lot to do still. Namely, adopt and implement the European budget, the MFF. This is critical for investment in our regions all over Europe. This is indispensable for the first priority we have, the fight against unemployment, notably youth unemployment. Another priority, advance and implement the banking union. This is critical to address the problem of financing for businesses and SMEs. These are our clear priorities, employment and growth. Our job is not finished. It is in its decisive phase. Because, honorable members, the elections will not only be about European Parliament, nor will they be about European Commission or about the Council, about this or that personality. The elections will be about Europe. We will be judged together. So let us work together for Europe with passion and with determination. Let's not forget that 100 years ago, 
Europe was sleepwalking into the catastrophe of the war of 1914. Next year, in 2014, I hope Europe will be walking out of a crisis more united, stronger, and open. I thank you for your attention.